And that's why there can be no best way to set up your life for, you know, for happiness or the way to set up your habits, because the fact that it works for somebody doesn't mean that it will work for everyone. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, we have a very fun episode for you on happiness, human nature, motivation, and experiencing a deeper, richer life through activating your five senses. Our special guest today is Gretchen Rubin. Gretchen Rubin is one of today's most influential and thought-provoking observers of happiness and human nature. She's an unusual combination, a literary writer who explores how we can put transcendent ideas into practice. Hello, Gretchen. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm so happy to be talking to you. I know. I'm so honored because I've honestly, I've known about you in the space for so many years and you really are a leader and a thought leader in the space that I respect and admire. So thank you. Yeah. I'm so excited to be having this conversation. Right. So to begin, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey getting here? Like what inspires you to keep writing and sharing? Well, in general, what inspires me is reading. I'm somebody who loves to read and that's really always where I get my, you know, it's my my playground and my cubicle. So I read for fun and it's also where I get a lot of my ideas and get my excitement to keep writing myself is through reading. Tell us about what sparked your interest in writing about personal development. You know, it's interesting because um, I've written a lot of books. Like I wrote a, a biography of Winston Churchill and one of JFK. My first book was called Power, Money, Fame, Sex, A User's Guide. And I think for people who know my books like The Happiness Project or Better Than Before, it seems odd um, that I wrote those books. But to me, they all feel uh, very unified because what I'm interested in is human nature, who are we? How do we know ourselves? How do we change if we want to change? You know, what what is the nature of human nature? And so that is what is interesting to me. And and I got the idea for writing about happiness just because in a very inconspicuous moment of my life, I was stuck in a city bus and I thought to myself, well, what do I want from life anyway? And I thought, well, I want to be happy. And I thought, I don't spend any time thinking about whether I am happy or if you can be happier. I should have a happiness project. And uh, I just ran out and started researching happiness just for myself, just for my own interests. And then I realized what a vast, inexhaustible subject it is. And ever since, I've just been going deeper and deeper and deeper into the subject of happiness and, and human nature. Yeah. Have you always been this interested in human nature or is this something that like it, it sparked some point in your life? I think I always have been. I think I didn't understand how to frame it for myself. You know, like looking back when I think one thing that's very true for me is my whole life I've gotten, I will get really interested in something and do kind of like a, a lot of research and note taking just on my own. And, you know, but for years it didn't, I didn't really understand what, that that was part of a process. It was just sort of something that I did. I didn't know how to characterize my interests. Looking back on the work that fascinates me, like I'm absolutely fascinated by the writing of Andy Warhol. This is something my whole has been true for, for many, many years, but it's only recently that I sort of understand why I'm interested in the work of Andy Warhol and what it is about his work that interests me. I sort of, I, I kind of didn't know how to frame it in my own mind, funnily enough. Um, so I think it's an example of sometimes we don't really know ourselves as well as we might think we do. So with that example of Andy Warhol, like what was it about it that interested you? Andy Warhol just has this bonkers mind. I mean, he just has, th you know, this is the thing. I don't know about you, but usually, usually when I read books or novels or whatever, I'm thinking, well, I don't know that. And I wouldn't write that, but I could write that, you know, or maybe something's masterfully done. And I'm like, I could never achieve something of that excellence, but I, I see how you get there. Andy Warhol has says things I'm like, I could never have that thought. <laughs> I would never think that. I don't yeah. think that way. I see that you are thinking a thought that is so outside the way. I think that it just expands my mind. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, oh, so like that's fun. someone like George Orwell, I'm like, I could never achieve his mastery, but I understand his thinking. Andy Warhol, I'm like, wow, I don't, I, it's, I don't understand how he got there, but I'm fascinated. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay. So throughout all your books, which would you say is your favorite that you've written and why? Oh, the book that I'm writing, every book, it's always the book that I'm writing now <laughs> is my favorite book. I, with every book I think, oh my gosh, it's all downhill from here. I'll never have a subject that I love as much and a book that I'll have so much fun writing. And, you know, I can, it can never be this good again. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, no, this is the best book. This book was the most interesting. This book was the most fun. So it's always, it's always what's the most recent is the one that is closest to my heart. No, that's amazing that you have that level of energy and excitement for your current book. Um, and, and once the, a book is published, how do you feel about it? Do you, is it kind of like done and you're like on to the next one? Or do you like, you know how people, some people don't even like to reread <laughs> their, their work. So how, how do you feel about your work? I don't often go back and reread it, um, partly because it's, it's kind of arduous because I remember every, kind of all the, <laughs> all the, the details. stress and strain. Yeah. Um, but I will often refer to it. Um, and, you know, and also now, uh, because of the way I work, I have a podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin. And, you know, I'm very online in social, uh, you know, on social media. Mm-hmm. I have an app. Like, I have a lot of ways to knit my content together and knit my thoughts together and sh- see how they relate to each other. Sometimes in ways that, I, it, it, you know, only come out like five years later. Like now, when I look back at the Happiness Project, which was more than a decade ago, a lot of what I write about in Life in Five Senses, I laid the groundwork there without realizing it. So they're all much more knit together than I think for some people, their work is kind of more disconnected, whereas my work tends to build on itself. So I will often be talking about things that, um, like in my book, Happier at Home, I wrote a lot about the sense of smell which I thought about sort of in isolation, but now in my book, Life in Five Senses, I'm kind of, I'm talking about all the five senses and the, the sense of smell is an aspect of that. So it's all, it, it kind of circles around and goes deeper and deeper as my understanding mm. grows. So, right. You're basically, you're covering a similar topic, but you're getting deeper and deeper with, with your, cause you've grown, you've learned, right? Yes. And, I, and I'll shine a spotlight on a different part. Like here's something, like when I wrote the happiness project, you know, I tried all these resolutions, you know, and uh, to see if they would make me happier. And, I, you know, the idea of the book was, OK, I'm this guinea pig. I'll experiment on myself. I'll tell you what works. And so after the book came out, people kept saying to me, but how did you get yourself to do those things? And I said, well, I just decided if I thought something would make me happier. And then if it did, I kept doing it. And then but they would look very puzzled. They'd be like, well, how did you get yourself to do it? And that's when I realized this is a problem of habit formation. Yeah, It's not that people don't know what would make them happier. They do, but they are not able to stick to it. Um, so they know they would be happier if they got more sleep or stayed off social media or spent more time with their friends or, you know, exercise more, but they're just not doing it because, and so then that led me to my book better than before, because that was okay. Then if you know that you do want to do this or stop doing it, how would you, how would you tackle a habit? And, um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't that I didn't, I understood that habits were important, but it was only by like getting out there and talking to people that I realized, well, this is a big challenge for people. And then also I started realizing, well, I'm different from other people. How am I different from other people who seem to struggle with this more than I do? And that's when I realized my four tendencies, personality framework, because I started seeing like, oh, there's this pattern in the kind of challenges people face. So so everything builds on its on each on the what went before. I love that. It's kind of like one book sparks a bunch of questions and then you get curious and you're like, "Oh, let me explore that. Let me answer that." <laughs> well, it's interesting too because now there's so many ways to for for people who read a book to respond to the author, you know, in a way that wasn't possible years ago. And so often this really deepens my understanding and and makes me curious about something else. Because again, like with, with habit formation, as people kept talking to me about their own challenges, that's when I started thinking like, oh, there's really, there are these deep patterns more than I think I would have been able to notice on my own. But because I was in constant conversation with people, I was like, wow, this keeps coming up or people keep having this question or people keep using this phrase, even like January 1st is an arbitrary date. I was like, why is it that for some people that's really meaningful? Uh, because it doesn't matter that much to me. 
Anyway, if people are curious about the four tendencies, they can take my quiz and find out if they're upholders, questioners of Liger's rebels. Yeah, uh, that's quiz.gretchenrubin.com. That's like a whole... It's a whole study. Like you created your own study. personality test. I and did. It's, <laughs> I love I it. I did. But, but, once you, but once you know them, they're very, very obvious. Like we could do the Game of Thrones characters. We could do Parks and Rec. Like they're, they're all over the place. Um, right. But it was because uh, I was in this, this conversation with the audience um, about these subjects. It really deepened my understanding and, and got me curious. Hi, my loves. I just want to take a quick break to let you know about the new Dream Life Club, our new membership program featuring monthly live events and workshops for personal growth and wellness, goals, accountability, masterminds, and community, a powerful resource for your dream life journey. The Dream Life Club is a space to connect, learn, and grow together and find more support and empowerment as you go after the life you want. If you've been searching for a positive, supportive community or a way to commit more consistently lead to your personal growth and healing journey, this is for you. Learn more and join now at lavendaire.com slash DLC. That's lavendaire.com slash DLC. I'm so excited to have you. I'd like you to share with us just your general, I guess, mindset or philosophy about life, like how you go about living your life. I think my main mantra for myself is I want to accept myself and also expect more for myself. So I have 12 personal commandments and the most important one is be Gretchen. Um, and of course, everybody would have to substitute their own name, but you know, I want to be true to myself. Um, but I also want to expect more for myself. So I don't want to stay in my comfort zone. I want to push myself. I want to grow But I think only I can be the judge of whether something is accepting myself or whether I really should expect more from myself, which often is not that fun, frankly. You know, expecting more from yourself often means work or insecurity or frustration. A lot of times when we're growing and learning, it can be tough. Um, And it's easier to just be like, "Eh, I don't don't think that's something for me. Um, But uh, so that's, so accept myself and expect more for myself. Okay. What what else is on that commandments list? Is it, you said there's 12, right? Mm -hmm. One of them is enjoy the process. So that's don't focus on outcomes, but really try to enjoy the process. One is no calculation. My spiritual teacher is St. Therese of Lisieux. And she wrote, when one loves, one does not calculate. And I can be like a real scorekeeper, bean counter type of person. And so I'm like, no calculation. Are these that, like, when did you begin writing these commandments? And tell us about the development of them. Like, how did you, do you swap them out? Like, is it kind of like you just keep adding to it as you find something that you want to live by? I really settled on these 12. And this was something I did as part of the Happiness Project. Um, I'm a big believer in kind of writing manifestos or, you know, or, or, or finding ways to crystallize ideas in, in succinct form. Um, I think that really clarifies my thinking. So when I was writing the happiness project, I was sort of trying to understand like, well, what were, what were my most basic principles for how I wanted to live my life? Not things like make the bed, but things like enjoy the process. Mm-hmm. And I really worked on this list for months and it got shorter and longer. And sometimes I would think like, well, the, I have, this as two items, but it's really the same idea or this doesn't, isn't really important enough. So, um, I played around with it for a long time and then I, and then it, it went to 12 and then it, it stayed at 12. Yeah. Oh, and so you've committed to that since then. Yeah. It's just, oh, it amazing. is the natural number. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so you've been like a thought leader in the space for a long time. I'm just curious in the early years, who were your biggest inspirations, your influences, like, who did you look up to? I mean, old time. Uh, Benjamin Franklin is a huge, um, I really, I love the way Benjamin think- Franklin thinks. Um, I'm a huge student of Samuel Johnson, who is not for everyone, uh, but is, uh, to me, just this remarkable, just has remarkable insight into human nature. And I can, you can read a, a study, you know, that's, a hundred pages long and Samuel Johnson has kind of managed to sum it up in a sentence. So I think those were two. And then I have like 
different people that I learned from, like Julia Child and her enthusiasm. I'm not interested in cooking or French mm-hmm. food, but just her enthusiasm. Or Virginia Woolf, who I find is uh, like really remarkable in her way of using metaphors and and themes. And um, and then I think for pure writing, for pure clarity of thought, George Orwell, um, because I, he's so unexpected. And, and yet so clear, I, I, and, and he has such a strong voice and yet it's all, um, very restrained. Um, so I think those are some of the, the, some of the major influences on, on the way that I think, or the way that I approach things. I think it's amazing hearing you, hearing the energy in your voice when you talk about these inspirations. Um, so I guess you're so curious about human nature. What about people fascinate you? Does anything still surprise you? Oh, constantly. Yes. (laughs) I constantly surprise myself. Okay. Um, I mean, I mean, why do we do what we do? Um, or why do we not do what we want to do and how can we change if we want to change? I mean, I'm fascinated by that. You know, anytime someone does something successfully, I'm always like, how did you do that? Um, I really want to know, you know, how did you do it? And often people are, are, aren't very good at explaining how they did something, which is why I think sometimes they find it hard to repeat because they don't yeah. understand what, how they set themselves up for success or not. And, and, you know, and sometimes it's charming and then sometimes it's kind of like, oh my gosh. I mean, I just remember this. I can be a happiness bully. My sister, who's the co-host of the happier podcast with me, calls me a happiness bully because if I think there's a way for you to get happier, I can get kind of insistent. (laughs) So I was talking to a friend of mine and he was like, okay, my new year's resolution is I'm going to get up early and go for uh, at least a two mile run every morning before work. And I was just like, have you met yourself? Because no, you won't. I mean, I don't want to be discouraging, but you're a night person. You can barely get up out of bed in time to get to work. I mean, I see how slowly you move in the morning. You're a night person. You should try to exercise later in the day. It would just, it's, you're just going to set yourself up for success better because that's when you're, you're most creative and productive and energetic. And it's going to be a lot easier for you to do something like that later in the day. And this was like a revelation to him. Because he just believed like, oh, if something's important to you, you should get up and do it first thing. And he wasn't doing it. He's like, what's wrong with me? I'm lazy. Instead of saying like, oh, 30% of people are night people. And, you know, I have a friend who exercises every night at midnight, which I could not do. And it certainly doesn't sound like a good system, but it works great for her. So why should anybody say that it's not a good idea? Um, So I I think uh, that's always surprising to me is like, just how people, what people do and the systems they come up with for themselves. I think it's eye-opening because you get to explore so many different types of people. And it's a reminder to everyone that we're so different. Not one thing doesn't work for everyone. So don't try to fit yourself in a box. Like I also am a night person. I like exercising at night, like around like 8 p.m., 9 p.m. But it's different for everyone. So instead of thinking you're broken, (laughs) you know, like you're just different. I couldn't agree more. And I think that that's one of the things that um, is really too bad is I think people really do search for like the best way or the right way. They're like, show me the study that will tell me, should my office be messy or neat? And whenever people sort of want to, you know, they want the one pager that's going to tell them like how to do everything. I always say to people, well, what's the best way to cook an egg? And then they always are really puzzled and they're like, well, it depends on how you like to eat your eggs. And then like, and some people are like, well, I don't even like eggs. And I'm like, right. And that's why there can be no best way to set up your life for, you know, for happiness or the way to set up your habits, because the fact that it works for somebody doesn't mean that it will work for everyone. And, you know, for some people, accountability is crucial. They have to have outer accountability, even to meet an inner expectation for themselves. So if they want to read more, they have to join a book group or, or read with their children to keep their kids engaged in their homework or think about their duty to their future self or whatever it might be. But for some people, accountability is actually counterproductive. They don't like the feeling of somebody looking over their shoulder. They don't want somebody to give them a deadline or to tell them to keep going or even encourage them or praise them. They don't want accountability. And so if you say to somebody, a rebel in my framework, who doesn't benefit from accountability, if you say to them, well, you should just sign up for a class, 
and then they do and then it doesn't work because they never go. It's like, yeah, that's not surprising mm-hmm. because yeah. for some people that is not, a, that's not a useful tool. As somebody who writes a lot about happiness, a lot of people assume that I'm a huge advocate of meditation. I've tried it twice. I mean, for months at a time, <laughs> it is not a tool that works for me. I'm not saying it's not valuable. I know many, many people, people that I know well, sw- you know, swear by meditation. My college roommate does like three hours of meditation wow. a day. <laughs> wow. It's, it's not a tool that works for me. And that's fine. So instead of thinking there's something wrong with me, why can everybody else do this, but I can't, or spending a lot of time doing something that's frustrating, I can be like, there's a lot of ways to achieve aims. Whatever I might have thought I wanted to get from meditation, is there another way to do it? What's a way that could work for me? Because just because, just exactly what you were saying before, just because something works for someone else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And if it doesn't work for you, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means what's something else to try? Because, and that's one of the things by studying this is you realize there are so many ways to achieve our aims. It's so fun to see all the different things people do to achieve the same aims with the, the incredible creativity and imagination. Um, but you sort of have to decide like, oh, something's not working. Let me try something else. Or if something worked really well in this one area, why don't I see if I can apply that same principle to something else? Which with accountability, I think a lot of people do figure out that they benefit from accountability. So they, they, they build it into many aspects of their life. But some people do haven't kind of figured out that pattern, so they're not able to take advantage of it. Yeah. I think this is so refreshing to hear. And it's like, it's also a reminder for me because I'm a person who shares these tips and things, but I can only share what works for me. Like, don't expect everything that I do is going to work for you. And instead of, um, instead of seeing yourself as like, oh, I'm not fitting in this box is like, have, be, be constructive. Like, oh, if this not is not working, what else can I try? And I see you're kind of like an experimenter. You're, you're learning from everybody and then, and then you experiment everything, right? What advice do you have for people in that journey of figuring out what works for them? Because it can be infinite, right? It's like, it never ends. Well, I do think the fi- the four tendencies framework is helpful. Should I just quickly yes. explain Let's what that is? Let's go over the four types. Okay, the four types. So, right. So, yeah, I will explain this. And usually people know exactly what they are from just this brief description. But again, you can take the quiz at quiz.gretchenrubin.com mm-hmm. and it will give you an answer and a little report. But again, most people don't even need to do that. So what it looks at is how you respond to expectations. So there are outer expectations like a work deadline And there are inner expectations like my own desire to get back into meditation. So depending on whether you meet or resist outer and inner expectations, it makes you an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, or a rebel. So upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. So they meet the work deadline, they keep the New Year's resolution without much fuss. They want to know what other people expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. So their motto is, discipline is my freedom. Then there are questioners, questioners, question all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. So they resist anything arbitrary, ineffective, unjustified. They need to know why. So they're making everything an inner expectation. If it meets their inner standard, they'll do it no problem. If it fails their inner standard, they push back. So their motto is, I'll comply if you convince me why. Then there are obligers. This is the biggest tendency for both men and women. You either are an obliger, you have many obligers in your life. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. So to meet an inner expectation, they have to have a system of outer accountability. You want to exercise more, work out with a trainer, work out with a friend who's annoyed if you don't show up, take your dog (laughs) for a run, raise money for a charity, do your duty to your future self, but you have to have that outer accountability. So their motto is, you can count on me and I'm counting on you to count on me. And then the final tendency is rebel. Rebels resist all expectations outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do, anything they choose to do. But if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And typically they don't tell themselves what to do. Like they don't sign up for a 10 a.m. spin class on Saturday because they think, I don't know what I want to do on Saturday. And just the idea that somebody's expecting me to show up is going to annoy me. So their motto is, you can't make me and neither can I. (laughs) <laughs> so when you know your tendency, you know how to set your, you're, you're much, it's much easier to set yourself up for success because you think, okay, 
given my tendency, what are the kinds of strategies that tend to work for people of that, of that strategy? So, you know, you might be working out with a trainer who wants to tell you like every bit of research and every scrap of fact to help you stay with your program. And you're like, I don't need to know all the why, why, why I need the accountability. Yeah. Basically it's so empowering to know your type because then you know how to motivate that type. And then you also learn about the people in your life. Cause like when I learned about these four types, I'm like, okay, I think I'm an upholder, maybe an obliger, but mostly upholder. Cause I'm, I care about fulfilling both outer and inner. Right. And then my boyfriend is a complete rebel. Like you can't make him do anything. He doesn't want to commit to anything. Right. He doesn't. Ooh. That can be a tough combo. (laughs) Right. So you have to learn to work with people who are so different from you. And also like learning as an upholder how to motivate a rebel. It's been very difficult. Yeah. They see the world so differently. They they are opposites. And um, one, I will say for people who are listening who maybe are rebels or uh, are, are related or work with rebels it's the it's the most different tendency. I think it's the one that's the most misunderstood and as a consequence is often the most frustrated and most frustrating because people don't understand how to approach a rebel in a way that works for the rebel tendency. Like they will try to give them accountability or they will try mm-hmm. to like, you know, lecture to them about reasons <laughs> or they will resist when a rebel is like, well, I f- it's 2 a.m. I feel like doing it right now. And they're like, why don't you wait until the morning when I can help you? And it's like, no, don't say that to a rebel. Let a rebel do what they want to do when they want to do it in their own way. Like just back off. Don't give them a lot of encouragement. Don't give them a lot of reminders and nudges that will backfire for a rebel. So often people trying to help rebels actually make things worse. Mm. So what's the way to help a rebel then? One thing for rebels is that identity is an incredibly high value. They want to put their true selves out into the world. They're very, very authentic. And so it's like, if you are a rebel or you're trying to work with a rebel, is to be reminded of that of that identity. So you're doing this not because somebody told you to, not because you said you would, not because you're supposed to, but because this is the kind of person you are. You're an athlete. You're a healthy person who likes to feel strong and energetic. You're a food lover. You're a responsible, responsive boss. You're a loving, considerate partner. You're somebody that I can count on. You're a, you're a high-minded person. You're an environmentalist. So once a person is like, I'm an environmentalist, then certain actions follow from that identity, which is not the way the other three tendencies think about it. It's there; they might have the same actions, but they, it comes from a different place. Or you yeah. can give information consequences choice. This is when you give a rebel information they need. You tell them the consequences of their action or inaction, and then like you let them choose. So you could say mm-hmm. something like, "You know, if we pay this bill now, cool. If we pay this bill in two weeks, we're going to pay a three hundred dollars late charge." Right. You decide. <laughs> Use yeah, this information. You, you, you get know, to choose. Yeah. yeah and you, can't nudge, you can't nudge. You can't nudge. You can't remind. You can't rescue. You can't intervene. You just like have to like let ships fall where they may. Um, one thing Rebel says, you have to let negative consequences follow. Um, but then a lot of rebels are like learn to do things like use uh, auto pay because they're like one thing rebels don't like to do is things like pay bills over and over on time, which they just hate that feeling. Um, so it's like, okay, put that on auto payment and now you don't have to worry about it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So fascinating. I I love this. Um, okay. So next I, I want to ask you, you, you've been doing, you've been writing and podcasting for many years. What are some of the biggest concepts or lessons that you know now that you wish you knew earlier? Well, one, it comes into this book, this new book that I'm writing life from five senses, um, because that really showed me how to, I could connect with the world and to myself and to other people through the five senses. And I don't, I, you know, I'd been doing so much work on happiness for so long, but I had just started to feel like something was missing. Like there was something, there was an area that I was neglecting and I couldn't put my finger on what it was. And then finally I realized it was, I just was so up in my head. I was Mm -hmm. just walking around in a fog and I wasn't like connecting in a kind of rich, intense, vivid way with the, you know, um, through my five senses and having the podcast, I think helped me to understand that because I would hear from people who I think were more engaged with their senses, like people talking about all the different ways they listened to music or enjoyed sound or like people talking about different things related to taste and its connection to memories. 
And it started making me realize like, oh, I'm not thinking about those kinds of things the way I might think about something like the four tendencies, which I think about morning, noon, and night. And so slowly, slowly, and then because of sort of a remarkable experience that I had, I realized that this is an area to focus on, that if I wanted to be happier, healthier, more productive, more creative, um, I really needed to tune into the world through my five senses as a way to recapture that, that intensity. I think there there are different types of people in the world and some people just tend to be more like up here all in their mental space. And I could tell you're one of them. I am too. I'm always overthinking. And so sometimes we have to remember to like ground ourselves, go come back to our body, right? I think you're <laughs> right that for some people this comes much more naturally. Right. Some people others, are like nature true. people. They've been yes. doing this, but they're not maybe their mind is blank. They're just different. <laughs> different They're breeds, just different. Right? They're just different. I yeah. think yeah, I think for some people it really has to be a very conscious process. And so and and if so, okay, you know, then then it's sort of exciting because then there's this whole new world to uh revel in that so we've sort of been missing out on. Um, and so it's very exciting and energizing to tap into that. So what was the thing that inspired you to write this book? Is this like a, you said something remarkable happened. I, I think brewing in the background of my mind without me really understanding it. But then, so I had this really like ordinary problem, which was I got pink eye and I'm a person who sort of gets pink eye. So, you know, you let it go for a couple of days. It was, then it was pretty bad. So I thought I should go to the doctor. So I went to the eye doctor and yeah, he gave me some drops. I had pink eye. And then as I was walking out, he said very, very casually, he was like, well, you know what? Be sure to come back in for your regular checkup because as you know, you're at great risk. You're at greater risk for losing your eyesight. So, you know, we don't, we want to watch that. And I was like, wait, what are you talking about? I did not know that mm -hmm. I'm at greater risk for losing my sight. Why? And he said, well, you're very extremely nearsighted. And that means you're at greater risk of having a detached retina and that can affect your vision. So if that happens, we want to intervene right away. And in fact, I had a friend who had just lost some of his sight <gasps> wow. to a detached retina. So this is very, you know, felt very real to me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm walking, and of course, intellectually, I knew that. Um, and, and of course, intellectually, I knew that I could have a, a, a meaningful, rich life if, if I did lose, you know, my sight or another of my senses. But somehow this just struck me to the core of like really understanding what that meant. And so I go out on the street. I live in New York City. So I was walking home from the eye doctor. And all of a sudden in like this kind of freaky psychedelic moment, it was like all the knobs in my brain just got like turned up to the highest volume. And I could just see everything and I could hear every sound and I could smell, you know, the food trucks and the marijuana and the car exhaust and, um, and and just the feel of the air against my face, it all just became incredibly vivid. And I just thought, this is all happening all the time. And I'm not paying any attention. I've been ignoring it. And what if I lost it? I would think with so much regret about the fact that I hadn't even looked at the mo the most familiar sites of my neighborhood, you know, I still remember mm. looking down in the tree wells and seeing the plants there and just thinking, oh my gosh, like, did I have any idea? I've walked this block so many times, but I wasn't seeing it or experiencing it. And that just really, that shook me up and it made me realize that I was up in my head. Um, just like you said, and I needed, I needed to find a way to get back into my body and out engaging with the world through my five senses. Wow. That's such a cinematic moment. And in New York City as well, because <laughs> there's that's like what you see in movies, right? All the sounds, all the details, and it it's life. It's so alive. It's kind of like that because you know in a movie or a TV show where like they'll all of a sudden you can hear somebody breathing or you can all they 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 play with the sound or the clarity or you know uh, to show that effect of like a certain sense becoming kind of jacked up. And that's exactly how it felt to me. It was like some somebody had messed with the soundtrack and the and the smell track, and everything, and just br just brought it up in this sort of technicolor level of intensity. That's amazing. So, so in your book, I mean, how do you you know what are the things that you talk about in your book, and how to utilize our five senses? 
Well, I am kind of a street scientist and I always use myself as a guinea pig and I didn't know anything about the five senses. So um, so in the book, I talk about some research, just kind of like the things that I think the more you know, the more you notice. And so just to help people understand a little, this is not like brain diagrams or this is more like how does the, a regular person understand it's like i think a lot of people sort of understand especially after covid sadly understand that there's a connection between smell and taste and how those connect so it's but it's just like interesting to know that okay if i handed you a jelly bean and you plugged your nose and you put it in your mouth you would just taste sweet because without your nose you taste sweet salty sour bitter or mm. and or mommy but then when you release your nose all of a sudden it will become like a complex flavor like cherry, vanilla, jelly belly, or whatever it is. Um, so I think it's interesting to sort of understand how things work that way. And then I just did a lot of, I just did a lot of things to explore my senses by, you know, little adventures, everything from going to Flavor University to writing a, a five senses portrait of my husband, um, to making a non-Newtonian fluid out of cornstarch, um, which is super fun. I highly recommend, and I'm, I'm a big fan of cornstarch, um, these days. Um, and so just kind of just things that an ordinary person can do without a lot of time, energy or money to just tap into the power of the five senses and really, and, and really gain all, I mean, the five senses, they help us like create and evoke memories. They help us connect with other people. They spark our creativity. They can calm us down or like, you know, boost us up. And and there's just so much delight in the five senses. What was your favorite experiment that that you did for the book? I'm a huge fan of the sense of smell, and so um, I went to fl- I took two classes in perfumery, and one of the classes all we did was sit around and just smell vial after vial after vial of smell, and that was fascinating. I, I discovered that I don't I can't really smell musk. So that was like something I didn't know about myself. That's not that uncommon, it turns out. So that was just so fun because as somebody, that's not something you do in ordinary life. Of course, I do now. There's this kit that I bought where it's all the, the if you love coffee, it's all the different scents and kind of compo- elements of coffee, like potato. And oh, it's wow. just that kind of thing I love to do, but yeah, you just don't often have a chance to do it. And so that was one of my favorite things to do. And I did a bunch of taste tests with friends. I had friends come over and I had like different varieties of apples and we would like rate them and describe them and different brands of potato chips. Um, I gave them Red Bull without telling them what it was and like had people try to like figure out like, what is this liquid? And they had no idea what it was. Um, so it's, it was just, it was just fun and playful. And it was like a different, a twist on having people over that I personally found more fun than kind of like just the standard dinner party. So there were all kinds of like little things I tried that I really enjoyed. What would be one tip from the book that you want to leave the listener with? Well, there's so many. Um, one thing, I mean, and back to the, the thing about habits and wanting to change your habits. I think one thing that was really interesting to me is I think a lot of times when people are feeling kind of low energy or sort of bored or they want to give themselves a lift, they reach for an unhealthy snack, right? You hear that from people all the time. So what that is, is that's trying to get like stimulate your sense of taste as a way to kind of wake yourself up or give yourself a boost. But what I found is you can do that with any of your senses. So if you're like, ooh, I have a tendency to have like an unhealthy treat with taste, it's like, okay, well, what maybe you should just like take a big whiff of something like pickles um, or, or, um, or maybe like have a big t- sensation on your hands, like run your fingers through cornstarch. Or like I like I have one of those, um, you know, that fake fur that's like supernaturally soft. Like you're just like, what is this substance? It's just bonkers that it's just so soft. And I'll just run my hands over it, and it's just or, or like a or like a velvet pillow. I'm very. I, it turns out I didn't know this about myself before I wrote the book, which I'm very touch focused, much more than I knew. Right. And it's just like getting, or like even put your fingers on the spines of a cactus. Um, right. It, it, because it, it kind of gives you that stimulation and that little bit of distraction and shock. Um, but, or like I have a friend who loves music and so he saves new music until he needs to give himself a little bit of a, a little wow. bit of a jolt. And then he'll be like, okay, I'll listen to a new song. And that's what he does instead of going to the vending machine or reaching for a bag of I chips. I love that. 
Yeah. That's so actionable and helpful because it's true. We all snack when either you're bored or you're distract, you're trying to distract yourself or you just want a little boost. You can do that not by eating, but just with anything like blast a new song, (laughs) touch something spiky. (laughs) Yeah, yeah it, it it really works. Here's another funny one that I think is for a certain person is really useful. If you want to quiet a crowd, like let's say you need to have like you're having a big staff meeting and you need everybody to be quiet or you're giving a toast at a wedding and you want to call for silence, you can use the sense of sound instead of by like tapping on the glass or yelling, both of which are kind of annoying, blow into a harmonica. You don't even need to play mm. a tune on a harmonica, just go just blow into it. And there's something I've seen this happen where people is they're like kindergartners getting a signal from their teacher, you know, well-trained kindergartners. They just fall silent. People instantly know what that means. It's kind of uncanny and it's just so much easier and so much more kind of graceful and pleasing than a lot of the ways that people call for attention. I mean, that's such a minor thing, but I have talked to people where they're like, Oh my gosh, if you knew how much time I spent trying to get people to like just be quiet. <laughs> right. If you have like a chaotic household or if you have a, yeah, or yeah, you, anything. Or a workplace where mm-hmm. you sort of need to be the one to call people atten- to attention. Um, right. It just really works. Yeah. This helps you get more creative of like all the different solutions there could be, like to tap into all these different five senses. Yes. Wow. A thing that we talked about on the Happier podcast, and it was so interesting to see how listeners put their own twist on it. So I wrote a five senses portrait of my husband. So with each of the senses, I wrote five things I associated with him. So for seeing, I would put like, oh, you know, the rose colored fleece jacket he had like the first day we met that I've always remembered, you know. So it's my five things that evoked him in my mind. So I talked about that. Okay, so then when I was writing the book, Life in Five Senses, at the end, my editor said, Gretchen, I think for your about the author, you should write a self-portrait of yourself. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just wrote this whole book, Life in Five Senses. And yet, even for me, this was like a really challenging, interesting, creative exercise. So I wrote a self-portrait. We talked about it on the Happier podcast. And somebody said that her grandparents had recently died and she was going to do it as a way to memorialize them in these very concrete ways. So she was hanging on to those memories. And also her own children were so little, they weren't going to remember these family members. So she wanted to have a way to really convey kind of the concrete reality of these beloved uh, grandparents. And then somebody else said, oh, well, for my husband, I decided I would do a portrait of him and give it to him for his birthday. And she talked about how he was so excited, like, because you talk about people feeling seen. Well, you feel seen, you feel heard, you feel smelled, (laughs) you feel tasted, you feel like it's a way to kind of reflect back on somebody what's important to you about them. And so again, it's like, It's not that hard to do, but it does take a lot of creativity and imagination and and kind of thinking in a way that's really pleasing, but it it really feels like something once you've created it. So I think that's that's another way of like thinking about the five senses in a way that's, I think people are always just like light a scented candle or like sip a cup of coffee really slowly. And I'm like, oh, you know, sure, nothing wrong with that, but But there's so many other other things. things (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> let's 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 stretch ourselves to come up with a few more ideas. Wow. Okay, so after your exploration with this book, what how has your life changed? Like have you changed anything about your lifestyle, your routines? Oh yeah. No, I do so much more uh related to the five senses. I mean, one of the things that changed a lot for me was about music because when I went into this I really thought of myself as someone who re- really didn't respond to music, who didn't listen to music. I w- I'm not a hearer. I'm not, uh, you know, we ha- most of us have like more appreciated senses and less and neglected senses. And it was definitely one of my more neglected senses. But when I was working in the book, I was studying music because music is so important. It's this universal aspect of human culture. All human cultures have music and no one really knows why. It's like a big debate. Like why, if it's not evolutionarily necessary, why is, why do we all have music? It's fascinating. But then a friend of mine, the producer of my podcast, who's a huge music person said to me, he's like, but Gretchen, you always say you're not that into music, but I think you are into music, but in your own way. And that was, this is right back to what you and I were talking about before. I thought my way was the wrong way or my way was the illegitimate way because it wasn't the way other people seem to like music. So I thought, well, there's something wrong with me. But in fact, what I realized is I love a song. 
I like songs. Some people listen to music. Like they're like, I like hip hop. I like country. I like everything by a certain artist. Like I listen to Prince all the time or whatever mm-hmm. it might be. And I realize I just like the one song. So I don't want to <laughs> listen to someone's whole album or I don't want to go to a concert because I just like the one song. But there are these few songs that I really, really respond deeply to. So instead of always thinking like, oh, if I just spent some time and took a class and learned to play the ukulele, I could get into music the way other people did. I was like, no, I like the song. So let me make a playlist of my songs. Let me really look for ways to collect my songs, which are fewer, but that's the way I like to listen to music. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different way of connecting to something that also for me is a very deep pleasure. It just looks different. Okay. So going back to how your lifestyle has changed. So you've incorporated more music, anything else? Oh, so many things. Um, well, one thing is a lot of times now people don't like for you to wear perfume out in the world. Um, there's some people love it. Some people do not like it. So now I wear perfume to bed every oh, night wow. because I'm okay. like, I love it. Just um, for yourself. Just yeah. for myself. I love it. Love and, um, and so I, I do that very consistently now. It's like such a, it's such a treat. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, there's, gosh, there's so many things. I mean, one thing is I just will stop and look at things like, okay, so I live in New York city and I was killing time before a meeting and I went into the Plaza hotel and you know, there's like Eloise at the Plaza and it's this whole thing of this little girl who lives in the Plaza hotel and you know, so there's this tea room that's kind of like a tourist site in New York city. And I just was like, "Mm, let me just go look at it. And I realized I went in there and I just stood there looking around for like, 10, 15 minutes. And I realized in the past, I wouldn't have done that. I would have like glanced through it and then walked out. I would have felt like go, 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 go. But now I've really trained myself to to stop and look and listen Mm -hmm. and like really take things in. I mean, a huge thing that's changed in my life is I go to the Metropolitan Museum every day. I am so fortunate. I live live with it. (laughs) Not Wednesdays. They're closed on Wednesday, but, um, (laughs) They are, uh, I live within walking distance, so I'm incredibly fortunate, but I've lived within walking distance of the Met for years and I didn't go very often. So I thought, okay, for part of my experiment for Life in Five Senses, I'll go every day and see how the experience changes over time. And I mean, I said I would do it for a year and that year is long over and I just love doing it so much that I go So you kept going even after a year? I think I'll keep going for the rest of my life. Yes. So I, I, tell us about what you, I guess, you know, going to the same museum every day, what is that like? What more do you see? So much more. Oh my gosh. It's <laughs> funny. I mean, this one is of those- a place where people like travel to go to once in their life, maybe, right? Like, um, so, so yeah, I, you're so unique in this experience. Tell yeah. Us about well, it's it. funny because now I'm almost like, well, why would you go just one time? Like it exactly. almost feels it's pointless. Cute. No, I mean, one of the things that was interesting is like when I started the, the Met felt very vast and like sort of unknowable and I kept getting lost and I didn't know how parts connected. And now I kind of know where everything is in a way that I, I sometimes play Met roulette, which is I bought a huge book of objects in the Met. I'll open the pages at random, look at an object and see if I can walk straight to it. Like, ha- do I know where it is for sure? Or do I know that collection well enough to be like, well, if it's this kind of thing, it's probably in this place. So that's fun. Um, there's always new exhibits. I'll read about something and I'll be like, well, I'll go look for it. And then like on something like President's Day, I'm like, let me go look and see what presidents are in there. It's like, not, not necessarily ones you think. So do you just see like pieces every day? Like what, what's your strategy or no strategy? Sometimes I just wander. Sometimes I'll pick like, I'll be in a mood. Like I'm like, I want to go someplace like quiet and kind of beautiful. So I'll like go look at some Chinese scrolls. There's a garden in the Met, which is bonkers on the second floor (laughs) of the Met. There's a scholar's garden with like a pond with fish in it and growing (gasps) plants. Sometimes I'll go in there like, and that has a a big skylight. So like, it's so exciting to go in there when it's snowing or when it's raining and you can see it like falling above your head. Beautiful. Sometimes I feel like, um, I love miniatures. Like there's these beautiful Egyptian miniatures, like tomb objects that I'll like, Ooh, let me go look at those. I'll have like little things that I'm, I don't, I just have all these sort of different, when Pantone releases its new color every year, I'm like, oh, I'll go look for that color and see if I can figure out like, is this a color that the Impressionists use? Or is this like a medieval color? We'll find out. So sometimes I just wander. Sometimes I have a little, uh, like a prompt. A little, yeah, a little assignment, yeah. a little prompt. <laughs> 
sometimes I'll be like, oh, it's been a long time since I've been to Visible Storage. Why don't I go see what's up in Visible Storage? But one of the things that's interesting is how the Met changes much more than I thought. Just today I was in uh, the Greek, Greek and Roman gallery and I'm like, this this well thing was not here before. This is the sculpture of a girl with a duck before. Where, where, where'd she go? Um, so it's kind of fun to see if I can notice little changes like that. And then I have my favorite objects that I go and just look at because I just love them. You know, the way you read and reread the favorite, pa- you know, favorite passage of a book. I'll just go look at an object because I love it so much. I think this is such a beautiful metaphor for like how you can always find something new in life. Like some people, they they live their life and they think it's mundane because it's the same. Maybe you're walking the same road, you're living in the same house, or but the fact that you're able to go to the same place every day and see something new, find like make it exciting each time. I think that it's it's a metaphor for how to approach life. Like it's, well, it's funny that you say things that. you can see, right? It's funny that you said that because that was a huge realization I had, which was the Met is my metaphor, that it really was yeah. a metaphor for exactly. me and like wanting to explore myself. But it's funny, like I, when I started that, I thought nobody would ever have this idea. It seems really strange that you would want to go to the same place day after day. Very Andy Warhol, by the way. Andy Warhol right. was fascinated by repetition. So that's wow. part of why I'm fascinated by his work. But I've since found out that this is something that, like like you mentioned, walking the same route. A lot of people like to do that. Like they'll walk exactly the same route and they kind of like seeing how it changes over time. I talked to a guy who goes to the same CVS drugstore every day and just kind of looks around and see, because you know what? Drugstores change a lot over the course of the year. And he like chats with the people who work there. And I'm like, I get it. It's kind of fun to see. Like I can imagine going to like a big grocery store and just, it just, there's a certain kind of pleasure that comes from seeing something change very gradually over time and sort of going deeper and deeper into it. Um, it is very satisfying. I found it to be this great way to kind of give myself recess. Like I just wander around. I just think about whatever I want to think about. You know, I think a lot of people want to do meditation and kind of discipline their minds. And I felt like I needed to let my mind off the leash. I needed to find like ways to play and wander and just kind of, let myself go and not try to focus or think or concentrate, but just stay open. Um, And so I find that to be really, really helpful. I love that you're able to dedicate. It, it's almost like you're you're getting a lot of benefits. Like you're able to take a walk, but you're also seeing all these new things. Like it's it's good on more than one level. No, one hundred percent. And then I have to walk outside to get there during the day, except Friday and Saturday you can go at night. But most of the time I'm going to the day, so I'm getting like light my face for the circadian rhythm. You're exactly right. Walking around that itself promotes. How long do you spend every day at the Met? It really depends. Like some days I'll just go very briefly and then some days I'll end up spending a lot longer there, maybe even than I plan to. Um, Because part of what I wanted to do is I was like, I wanted to just let it be open. It just, I don't try to structure it or like make demands of it or say like, I have to do this. Like I remember somebody said to me, well, you really need to sit down and like look at an object for a half an hour. And I was like, no, I don't. Maybe I'll want to. So far I have not wanted to do that. You know, but like her saying to me, like, so definitively, like this was the way to do it. I was like, there isn't one way. I've never listened to an audio book. I mean, back to the thing about me not being a very hearing focused person. I keep thinking like, I know I would love it. And the more, you know, the more you notice and I'm sure I would like get so much out of it. And I would, and it would really deepen my relationship with the museum. I'm like, I I just sort of don't want to I don't want to be listening. I don't want to be following somebody else's train of thought. I like being free. And that's okay. Yeah. You don't need to, if you don't, if you don't feel the urge, it's not for you. That's sort of what I decided. I'm like, I hope it's, I kind of hope that I will feel the urge because I think I would get a lot out of it. But right now I'm like, I'm not going to make myself do it because this is supposed to just be something that is shaped by my preferences instead of like my idea of what I should be doing. Yeah. I'm curious, how how do you split your time? Because you seem like you have a lot of projects going on, right? You have uh, yes, podcast, you're writing. <laughs> yes, so yes. how do you how do you have the time to to work and be productive, but also have all this free time to like let your mind wander and like you're always experimenting as well. So yeah. 
Well, it's interesting <laughs> that you say that because in the back to the four tendencies framework, I'm an upholder. And one thing about upholders is they can get very rigid and very kind of bound by their desire to execute. And so I think that's one of the reasons why something like going to the Met every day is really helpful for me because it sort of gives me, it, it allows me, I'm really good at discipline, but it, it allows me to use discipline to escape discipline. So for me, like putting it on the calendar every day, I know it's going to get done because that's the kind of thing I'm good at, but it's sort of like scheduling time to wander. Okay. Because, so that's one way that I do it. And, you know, I keep, I have a friend, Laura Vanderkam, who's a time use specialist, and she keeps saying like, oh, you know, track your time, you know, really see how you spend your time. Um, and, and, you know, you'll get all this insight and I have never done it. And so I don't really, like, I read a lot. And people are like, when do you have time to read? I'm like, I feel like I never get any time to read. And yet I read, I read, I get a lot of books read. And so I, maybe that's my next frontier is like, how, what do I do with my time? Exactly. How do you get this much done and feel like you're free? Uh, yeah, because I don't feel hurried. I don't, I, for the most part, I don't feel rushed. I don't feel up against deadlines. Upholders tend to really dislike being up against deadlines. I do, I, but I, you're a night person. I'm a morning person, so I will get up early and do a lot. That's when I do my best work is when everything's still very quiet. So I do get up at like five or six in the morning and just work steadily with like until, until at least nine when I have breakfast. Um, I walk my dog, but uh, yeah. It does sound like your next book. <laughs> yeah, time, right. right? Maybe, yes, that, yeah. Like studying how people use their time because we all have this 24 hours how, right. Some people maximize it. Some people don't. Some people, it, I, I also love what you said about, you have to schedule time to let your mind wander, like be disciplined about, I guess the freedom. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. Making that space. For someone like a rebel, they would not like that because they would be, I don't want to feel tied to that. Like I want to just like do what I feel like doing. But for me, it's like, I do work a lot and I needed to make sure that I just didn't work all the time. Yeah. I'm more like you where I have to schedule, I have to create limits. Like, okay, I'm going to end work at this time. This time I'm going to walk outside and it, it helps to have that structure. Yes. Give yourself limits to give yourself freedom. You know, that's one of the things that I, that I really do try to do is make sure that I, that I have everything that I need to like stay healthy and calm over the long term. Right. Okay, Gretchen, if you were to leave the audience with one message today, what would that be? Well, I think we've talked about it several times, which is there is no magic one-size-fits-all solution for happiness. We each have to figure it out for ourselves. And just because something works for someone else or somebody else enjoys something doesn't mean that the same has to be true for you. And if it's not true for you, there's nothing wrong with you. You do not mm -hmm. need to change. You just need to like set things up in a different way. But there's no one who can tell you what's important to you. You know, it depends on your nature, your interests, your values, your experiences, your temperament. And so I think sometimes people really do want to find an expert who can tell, you know, give them like the one page PDF with seven bullets on it. But the fact is there is no magic one size fits all solution. We all have to figure it out for ourselves. But I think we can learn from each other. Just like I learn from people and I hope that people learn from me because sometimes you hear somebody talk about something and you think, oh my gosh, that would never work for me. I can cross that off my list. Or you think, wow, that really sounds like something I would like to try. That sounds like the kind of thing that could work for me. And that's so energizing when you hear that. So I do think we can learn from each other, but in the end, we all have to decide for ourselves what's true for us. Definitely. And it's, it helps to like understand your, your nature, how you are, and then you can begin to relate. Oh, I'm, that person is similar to my nature. So I can kind of take, take what they're saying. And then if this person's completely different, then I understand we're just different and, and that's okay. Instead of saying I'm right, you're wrong, or you're right, I'm wrong. It's more like, that's interesting. And sometimes you have to compromise so you can create an environment where everyone can thrive, but that's different from saying you should do it my way because I'm right. Or I should do it your way because you're right. It's like our ways might be different. Right. We're both right for ourselves. <laughs> we can both be right for ourselves. Exactly. And you think that's not hard to understand or like it seems pretty obvious. And yet I think we've all kind of get into this idea of thinking, oh, of course you should get up and exercise first thing in the morning. It makes so much sense on paper. But if you're a night person, it's like, no, eh, it's not going to work. Not going to work out very well. Amazing. All right. Lastly, where can we find you online? 
If you go to GretchenRubin.com, that's my website. And you, there you can find all sorts of information about my books and all kinds of free resources that I have. You can take the quiz, the Four Tendencies quiz. Um, I have a Five Senses quiz I'm very excited about, ready to unleash that. You can find the podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin. And then I'm all over social media, at Gretchen Rubin. I also have an app called the Happier App, which has a lot of habit tracking tools if you're interested in like figuring out how to do a better job sticking to your habits. So, uh, and I love, as I was saying, I love hearing from listeners and readers about their own insights and observations, resources. I feel like the world is my research assistant because people are yep. constantly turning me on to like great new resources and cool podcasts and things like that. So Gretchen Rubin, in more places than you could ever want to find me. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Gretchen. I had so much fun. Thank you for sharing your energy with us. Everyone, make sure you check out Gretchen's new book, Life in Five Senses. I can't wait to read it as well. Thank you so much. I so enjoyed our conversation. 